start recording the video. So I'll record the video today. I want to try to do it on my own system because um, I still am getting complaints from a few people that um, that uh, the Teams ones have disappeared that they would used in the past. I have put up as many as I can on the YouTube site. So the past ones, if you mouse over, say, for the Bootcamp 1.5, it'll go to the YouTube site. And I'll do that from now on for, for all of these. Uh, I haven't done the link for today. It'll link to the old one, but I'll, I'll change that after this meeting. Okay, so um, what we're doing is we're um, going through the boot camp page 2.1 today. I'm just going to open that with this um, link here, and we'll just look at it together. I, I need to update that link too, which I'll do. So it's this page with the pig on the front. And uh, the idea for, for this page, for this bootcamp page, I'm just going to close my email so we don't get continually harangued as the emails pour in, um, <clears throat> is uh, really looking at the null hypothesis testing framework and uh, the, the relationship between um, questions and hypotheses and data collection. And um, uh, all of us have talked about that in some form or another. And uh, the one big innovation that I want to introduce in this, other than a few R tools, is um, I want to um, I want to um, suggest this framework for identifying questions um, and, and the statistical um, model before you start collecting data. So I'm going to introduce that idea, and then we build on it a little bit as the thing goes on. Does someone have a question? So I hear someone's mic, and I don't see who that is. So if you if you do have your mic and you don't have a question, mute yourself, please. Alrighty. So if I go back to the um, the page here, um, just like usual, I have the slides in HTML, and if you want to see the R markdown, you can do that too. And I'm first going to go through the slides, and with the remaining time. We can go through the script, and uh, we can either talk about problems, or I'll, I'll talk about potential solutions to the exercises at the end of the boot camp. Before we begin, any any comments or any other declarations before we start? Okay. So um, there we go. I'm just going to um, change the size of that a bit. So um, here we go. Now, every time you get a new data set, even if it's a quite small data set, but, but often data sets are heterogeneous, and even if you've collected them, uh, the very first thing you do with a new data set is we're just going to describe the data and make sure everything is as it seems. And uh, one way of calling that is um, if the data set is, um, is, um, <clears throat> is big, uh, we might want to weigh the pig. Okay, just an exp expression for describing the data set. What we're going to go over here is just an introduction to my take on the null hypothesis testing concept. Um, just to remind mind you, we do tend to teach this in a first statistics class over time. I'm going to talk about using summary, the summary function in R, um, the, the function of a few basic exploratory graphs, uh, what I call the EDA concept, so what we want to get out of it and how it sits with the rest of an analysis that we would want to document as a scientist. Um, probably the most innovative thing, if, if you haven't seen me give this lecture before, is, is this part right here, and that's the idea of a statistical analysis plan. I find that this, um, if I had to step back as a statistician and uh, pass judgment on statistics, the practice of statistics amongst scientists, this idea of the statistics analysis plan is the single thing that you could do to Im uh, improve your practice uh, that is the easiest thing for, for almost any scientist who doesn't regularly practice it. And, and it, it is, it's uh, not widely practiced, I have to say, amongst um, regular old scientists. So I, I consider it an important topic. 
And then if we have time, we'll go through some practice exercises or I'll field questions, do some live coding. All right. <clears throat> so um, the this idea of null hypothesis testing, it's almost a boring idea because we mention it a lot, but it bears mentioning again in this context because the, uh, the basics of null hypothesis testing, we, we tend to get told them once and then we kind of forget about them. And it's some of those important details that we're only told once, often before we've ever collected any data we actually care about, that, um, that are important. It's those details that are important. And there are just a few aspects of it. Well, we often think of the scientific process as starting with a question. And uh, we, can, we can think of that question in a lot of ways, and there's, there is actual jargon around this. Um, so you might call it a hypothesis, an objective. I like to think of it these days as a claim that you want to be able to make at the end of a study. And what we, what we should then do is we should make a distinction between the formulation of our question or our claim uh, with our statistical hypothesis. Now, um, this is uh, an important distinction be because um, when we're formulating our hypothesis, uh, what, what I often see when students or other interesting people are challenged with um, formulating a, um, a, a null hypothesis, they, they'll, they will frame their question in a, in a not true and in a true version, the null and the alternative hypotheses. Um, but, but what I often see is that uh, they, they, they don't actually frame the null hypothesis in terms of a statistical hypothesis. It should be explicit. If you're, um, if you're going to uh, perform a correlation test between two numeric variables, our null and our alternative should be phrased to include the specific um, hypothesis we're testing. For example, if uh, you are predicting that there is a significant correlation between two variables, the null hypothesis should be that the, the correlation coefficient is not different to zero significantly. What I often find is that we, um, when, I, when I see a formulation like that, it's a hybrid between our, our casual statement of our claim or our hypothesis and the formal hypothesis that, we, that is really part of the formal framework. So, uh, so a point here that's important is that these aren't the same thing. The, the casual statement and the null hypothesis is not the same thing. Another thing is that it's an, another thing that we're, we're told a lot, um, but it, the practice of it varies widely in my observation, is that the data, the data collection that you perform, we, when, our, when our nose is to the ground, when we're out, uh, I was out with with Matt and George today harvesting some potatoes uh, to collect data from them for this experiment we've been working on this summer. And um, when we're out there uh, every day conducting our experiment, we tend to start thinking that, well, those potatoes we dug up today are, are what's important and the data that we're collecting is what we're interested in. But actually we mustn't forget that that's not true. I, I don't care anything about the data on those particular potatoes for this particular season on those particular four rows out behind, you know, the Agriepi building. I don't care about them. What I really care about is the inference I can make on all the potatoes that I haven't measured. And so we need to design data collection to represent the, the population of interest that we are interested in. We do this with experiments and we do it by by sampling randomly, uh, but we mustn't forget that. And then finally, um, we use some objective test to do that. So we'll, we'll just spell this out. So the, um, the question or hypothesis stated in plain language, it, it might be something like the number of pollinator species is greater in hedgerows when pesticides are not used nearby. A phrase that as a claim. That's that's uh, phrased as an assertive, positive claim that I may believe, based on the scientific evidence, to be true. And then I want to go out and collect data 
that I can use to create information that would constitute evidence that this claim is true or that we refute the claim. Then an example of um, the statistical hypothesis for this is, um, is uh, the null and the alternative versions is that well, the mean species count of pollinators is not different. That's the null hypothesis. This null hypothesis is kind of important because that's the one technically that we're testing with all of these, these statistics that we're, we're familiar with. It's another point that we sometimes forget in, in practice. Here the alternative hypothesis would be that the, the mean species count of pollinators is different between places where pesticides are or aren't used. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> we, we need to have in mind a specific statistical test. There's a bit of a, I think one of the hardest things about learning statistics is that um, before you become proficient at thinking of this stuff, you need to learn a lot of different statistical tests and what situations they fit in before it's easy for you to, to look out and um, think of things in this philosophical versus the practical way we often think of them in. Okay, so, um, well, the objective test that I referred to is, uh, is a test of the null hypothesis, and we do that by generating a test statistic. We might use a t-test for that way that I, that I form that to compare two means, so a two-sample t-test. But what we really look at is the p-value. We calculate some p-value. and uh, uh, Yet another element here at the beginning of this, um, this particular boot camp page is, um, is the p-value is, is often widely misinterpreted. There, there's a whole body of literature um, on misinterpretation of the p-value by scientists in peer-reviewed literature. Uh, and, and some people, um, and let, let me say the correct interpretation, and then I'll, I'll say some of the pitfalls we can get into it. But what it actually is, is a probability that you are wrong if you reject the null hypothesis. That's just, it's just that, it's nothing more. And it, it could be attached to a, a parameter of a statistical test, like the slope of a regression or the correlation coefficient. Or it could be uh, uh, attached to a different parameter, like the chi-square parameter for a proportion test, or, or many of the others, any of the others. If we have a complicated linear model, like we sometimes talked in here, you, you might have a p-value associated with every coefficient for every variable that's, that's a, an explanatory variable for your dependent variable. So it's the probability that you're wrong. And we compare the p-value, this is where the, the alpha, the so-called alpha value comes in. We compare that p-value to the alpha. That's, um, just one moment, I'm, I'm getting spammed on Teams and I can't turn off Teams because we're using Teams. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, the alpha, the 0.05 threshold comes, it really is the maximum proportion of the time that we're willing to be wrong, or the maximum, maximum risk we're willing to be wrong. And it's why um, sometimes you may hear it's a, it's, it's a bit confusing, but you're free to, to set the alpha for your statistical test to any value. Um, that's, that's up to you. But if you set it, you know, above 0 0.05, someone else may not accept the evidence that you generate with that statistical test. Okay, so that's just a little uh, primer on that stuff. Um, <clears throat> now some, some and most of us have probably used the summary function before. In this example, we've read in some data. Uh, now this is example, this is available um, uh, in the, in the bootcamp page. Uh, and I've just read it in using Excel, uh, the read.xlsx function here from the open XLSX package. And um, uh, we're just going to look at it at first. This is a simple data set that looks at the weight of um, chicks after a few weeks of growth. And um, 
it uh, as two variables, um, the weight of those chicks and the, what feed they were run on. And I think there are five or six um, levels of feed. And uh, if we use the um, str function, structure function, we can look at the structure of a data frame. Now remember, we can see this visually if we look at the um, global environment in R. But uh, this just gives us an idea that weight is indeed a numeric variable, and it gives us a peek at some of the first values of it. And feed, it's read in as a character string. Now, really, it's a factor. You know, we would want to, if we wanted to model it statistically, we would count it as a factor. But it's it's read in by the passive aggressive Butler as as a uh, character string, and it assumes several values, and we see the first several rows of values here, which are all, all the horse bean. And um, if we use summary, finally, on the data frame, it's just a way to peek at the data. It's just a way to peek at, for a numeric variable, um, summary will give us a, a readout. And, and when we use it on a whole data frame, it will give us a readout, a column, in the output for um, for each variable. So we have two columns here for each of the two variables. If it's a numeric variable for weight, we just get some descriptive statistics. We get the um, minimum value and the maximum value. And we get the um, so-called interquartiles, so the first and third quartiles. And all this means is that 25% um, of the data observations fall below this calculated value and 25% fall above this calculated value. And, and that, you know, by extension means that 50% of your values fall between the first and the third quartile. So most of, most, half of your data falls between these values. We also have the uh, median, which is the middle value. If you rank all the values up, it's the middle value, or it's the average of the two middle values. Um, if you, um, if you have an even number of observations. And we have the mean. Why do we have both the, the median and the mean? Well, if the, if the median and the mean are very different, it gives us a little bit of um, an idea that the data are skewed just with these descriptive, just with these few numbers. Um, be, because the middle value, if you have a long skew in your data, will, uh, depending on which direction the skew is, Will um, will be higher than the mean if there's a long skew with a few really big values, or it'll be lower if there is a skew towards the low values than the mean. In this case, they're about the same. You know, they're not very different. 258 versus around 261. If you have a character um, uh, vector, what we get is we just get a uh, how many observations there are, and we just get a little bit of information. If it was a factor, if we converted feed to factor, we would get a little more different information. It does this for each variable type. Now, if you really wanted to look at a summary of your data, you're probably going to want to look at um, different parts to get some summary statistics. I think this is kind of a point of confusion sometimes when we're first learning these tools. Uh, oftentimes, if we're summarizing data like this, this is only for us to understand our own data. And we would never show these um, simple statistics to someone else unless we were wanting to generate evidence. And that evidence would be valuable to someone else. So mostly this is just examining um, uh, different parts of the data. So here what I've done is I've exploited um, the square brackets uh, syntax using the which function. And uh, the which is picking out the values of feed, so the row numbers of feed that have the value Cassian. So that's the feed type that, that uh, one of the feed types. And so then I'm picking out, I'm, um, I'm picking out those rows and I'm passing it to the square bracket syntax for the chick's weight variable. So this is going to pick out the the chick, just the chick weights that were fed Cassian. And likewise, I could do it for any of the values, so for horse bean. 
and uh, we you know we can just kind of get a look at how it's different we can see the mean is much higher for cassian than it is for horse bean we can see that the um, minimum and maximum value for um, the cassian are both respectively higher uh, than the ones for horse bean and so forth so we're just kind of peeking at the data and um, we have looked at a, in a previous, um, one of these previous boot camps at the aggregate function. The aggregate function is very, it's a game changer basically for your workflow. If you need to have these summary tables, um, you, you would tend not to, until, unless you're just beginning to use R, you would tend not to use many, many calls on the summary function to get all those different stats. Instead, you'd, you'd use this programmatic tool aggregate. So what if, what if I wanted to see, just quickly, just in a glance, or maybe even graph it, graphically, the, uh, the, the different means and, and variations for the different levels of feed? Well, I could do it in one function call to aggregate. And you'll recall that the way the aggregate works is we have some dependent variable we set to the argument x. And then we um, can partition uh, some function for that dependent variable against some categories. And uh, we have to pass them as a list, an R data object type list using the by argument. And then um, we can just pass a single function like the mean to the fun argument, but um, it's often more useful just at a glance to uh, generate several. And so we can pass actually a function that we create to this function. And here I've it's a function of the input x, which um, x has been set to chick weight. And um, here I'm going to calculate the mean, uh, the standard deviation, and you know I've just calculated the standard error of the mean here. And what we get out of this call is a data frame, a new data frame. That, and this is the whole data frame in this case. This is the entire output. And it has all the means in one column re respective of their their feed level, all the standard deviations, and all the standard errors of the mean. This is super useful. It's a tool to um, really get into. Um, imagine uh, this is a really just a toy uh, application of aggregate, but if you have a very large data set, um, oftentimes it's essential to do this kind of work. And it, it, in one little line of code, you could save what might take 50 lines of code or an hour or two hours in Excel. All right, so um, sum up that part of what I wanted to say. Summary, the summary function can be useful. We use it to understand and explore the variable types and the uh, central tendency of numeric variables. We use it to understand the data set. Um, even if you collect it, we kind of have to make sure that it's been entered correctly um, and if your data set's bigger than just a few lines of data, it's much faster once you get used to the abstraction of working in R. Oftentimes, I will use summary to look for unusual values, especially if it's a data set I'm not familiar with. Um, if some of you come to see me and we look at your data, it's one of the first things that I do. Now, uh, none of this um, exploratory data analysis I've described so far is mandatory. Um, but it, but it's often very useful. I do it a lot. Now, another thing I want to say is um, when we're first beginning is uh, this last little point, take care to keep a tidy script. What I mean by that is that uh, if you do a lot of data exploration in a data analysis script, just to help you make sure there are no warts, so to speak, in your data, um, I, will, I will tend to, um, if, if I'm going to keep that code, I will move it to the end of the, the last part of the script and I will put it in a code chunk that I call something like um, trash code or, or EDA because it's not going to be interesting to document our analysis. It's not going to even usually be relevant to our actual analysis. Um, or you just may delete it or minimize it. There's, we just keep in mind that uh, we write this um, code just for our own edification about the data but it's not, we, you know, we tend to document a script for our future self after we've already done that EDA work. We don't want to have to run through that every time. 
Um, so we want to take care to keep a tidy script. Now this is going to be super review for most people, but um, there are a few types of, of graphs that I always do during EVA. And if you worked with me at the, at the console, you've seen me do all of these um, many times probably. One type is the histogram that we use for looking at the distribution of a single numeric variable. Oftentimes we, I might stack several of them to compare distributions sometimes. The box plot, it allows us to see the central tendency of a numeric variable as a function of a factor that's got multiple levels. So this is, um, you know, I, I like to say, I know some of you have heard me say that recently that the, the box plot is named after the famous statistician George Box. It's not a joke, he invented it. He invented the way the summary statistics of the um, box hinges and whiskers go. Uh, and the scatter plot. The uh, scatter plot is the classic um, that shows dots of paired X and Y values. Y on the Y axis, uh, traditionally, the dependent variable, and X, an explanatory vari variable, on the X axis. So just two numeric variables. So we'll just look at each of them. Just a blast, because I know this is review for us, but I often do things, graphs like this, when I'm just peeking at data. So this is the default, um, new default in version 4 of our histogram. I think the graphics were just nudged very conservatively in version 4 of R. And I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but it looks a lot better. Um, and I've just drawn with the AB line a uh, vertical line at the mean value. Again, just to uh, just to, to show myself what's going on. Remember there are six different levels of feed going into this and it doesn't look very Gaussian. It looks bimodal, but really there are six means. Okay, let's look at the box plot. So I've just plucked out using um, the which function. I've plucked out the variables where chick feed is equivalent to using the boolean uh, equal equal um, meat meal or it's equivalent to horse bean. What this returns is the um, the row numbers where feed is either either equal to meat um, meal or horse bean and I've put those row numbers in the variable select. Okay so then when I make this box plot I wanted to make a I just did this when I was making this lecture. Um, I took that extra step really just practically so that the, the plot displayed more nicely. Um, but often we might do this if we wanted to look at just pairs of variables. And I've got the, uh, an R formula, weight as a function of feed. And I've set my data to um, chicks, the chicks data frame. And I'm using the square brackets and here I've set the rows to the row numbers in my select variable, comma, all the columns. I don't need all the columns. So there are the only the two columns. Even if I don't need all the columns, it, it's tidier code to leave that to be all of the columns by default. And I put labels on it. So we use the, the box plot all the time. I know um, we talk about ggplot2 in here and all the fancy looking graphics. They're, they're the three main graphics um, um, tools in R and I, I've argued before for the boot camp I've stuck to one of them. I've stuck to base R graphics. Um, you, any one of them that you get used to is the best. I think the base graphics are the easiest and ggplot is a little more complicated to start with but it does make nice graphs. But the point I want to make is that um, with just a little bit of options in, in the box plot function, you can turn this into a quite sophisticated graph, but we use it all the time. And then the last one is the trust the old scatter plot. And I've just made the, I've just made up some fake data as an example here. And then I've plotted that fake data, uh, y as a function of x, and I've just put a few vanity uh, aesthetics in there color and the PCH 16 is the shape of the filled dot rather than default the open circles. <clears throat> okay, let's summarize the EDA. B 
begins every analysis um, in some form, even if it's just a little bit. Um, we always do a little exploratory data analysis. Now, EVA is informal, um, and there's there are really no rules whatsoever for it. But um, remember I said that every analysis um, starts with it. And so if you find yourself analyzing a couple of data sets, even over a couple of years, and you have to invent the wheel every time for yourself, by which I mean you're um, viewing every data set as a, and every process to explore the data as a unique event, it's very inefficient. <laughs> you know, it, it will pay you even at an early stage of your career to um, come up with a few tricks and do, always do those tricks on the data. So um, it can be haphazard, but it will be much more efficient if you, if you develop your own approach, the minimum that you do every single time. Sometimes we use it for um, testing assumptions. For example, the assumption of, um, of Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve for, uh, for, for data. Remember, our, uh, for a lot of these models, um, and we'll cover this in the next couple of boot camps here, that our, our Gaussian assumption for um, statistical tests is often based on the residuals. So I would, I would often um, explore that during the EDA phase for a simple linear model. Um, and I think another way that I think of in the in EDA is that uh, we're creating information here just just for the analyst, just for yourself. We make a sharp distinction between that and something we want to document for someone else. And that someone else may be our future self. Uh, we've already analyzed and explored the data once. Um, so our future self, we can capitalize on the information that you've already worked to generate. We don't have to do the work a second time. But oftentimes it might be for a collaborator, a supervisor, uh, or somebody else who might find it useful. For example, more and more journals these days, I suspect um, this will just increase uh, in the near future, more and more journals um, condone and even um, request, and, and, and a few require that you share your, um, your data. Uh, and, and when you do, there are a few that suggest or condone, and, and just a very, very few require that uh, in addition to a method section, you provide extra detail to replicate your analysis. So an R script would be an example of one of the easiest ways to do that. So that's the distinction between EVA, um, information just for you to learn about the data versus that more formal documentation of your analysis. Now, EDA itself may or may not require reproducibility. Um, often it doesn't, but here's an example when it might, is uh, what if you come across a weird value in your data set and you make a decision, well, I'm going to exclude that data point from this analysis. Um, you know, this is a subjective decision. You might not even have a good reason for it. You may just doubt it. Um, so. In that case, if you've made a decision like that during your exploratory data analysis, that's something you would definitely document. You would want to document it rather than just deleting. I see often people will have multiple versions of a data set that has mutated during the course of EDA because they have found a weird variable or something and they, they just cut out that table from the Excel spreadsheet and save it as a different version. That's, the, that's an example of the poorest kind of practice because it's not reproducible. It, it instantly renders that EDA non-reproducible. You've made a decision that's not reversible if you only have um, the latest copy of the data. And it, it might even be worse if you said, okay, yeah, I've got actually these two data sets. They're both a little bit different. And you reposit them for posterity. That might even be the worst case scenario because then it makes replicating an analysis based on the data version even harder um, to be sure, or more work to be sure. And then finally, we just do this always primer, uh, prior to that formal analysis. <clears throat> okay, and just to 
just to draw a line under this, what I consider to be formal analysis is um, rather than just um, flopping the data around, this is designed specifically to generate evidence for those claims. That's, that's the whole point of uh, all of this, of the whole practice of statistics. That's formal analysis, generating evidence. Um, best practice, it must be strictly reproducible. I mean, uh, even if you don't plan to show it to somebody else, you make it reproducible so that, um, let, let me give you a practical situation. You get to your, you get, this happened to me. This is literally something that happened to me from my own PhD thesis. I got, I, it took, you know, I wrote them like everybody. I wrote my thesis over years. I, you know, wrote one chapter a year or something like that. And then I wrote the trash chapters all at the end within a month or something. Everyone does it the same way. But when I um, went to turn in my, my thesis, um, um, I got feedback during my Viva that, well, we really like the graphs in, um, in chapter five and the graphs in chapters two, three, four, and five, every chapter is a little bit different. We want them all to be just exactly like chapter five. Th it's pedantic. It's very specific advice. It's irritating advice, but uh, it does make a nicer thesis, and it, and some of my graphs, my earlier graphs, didn't fit the rules. If I made strictly reproducible code, um, and I, I didn't <laughs> during my PhD, but if I had, it would just be a trivial matter to drop in that code and rerun those graphs and do it rather than making them all from scratch. So that's a practical reason, but it's just best practice these days. Um, the whole point is to generate the information for others, even if that other is your future self. Um, there, we make a distinction between that and information that's just for the analyst, which isn't part of a, um, a reproducible code. Um, and then we always, with a formal data analysis, um, have uh, graphical and statistical components that we intend to communicate on to others. All right, so this I think is uh, maybe something new for some of you, and it's the idea of a statistical analysis plan. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of slides here, and it um, it is a, an idea that um, a number of people have have raised this issue, mostly statisticians observing the practice of statistics in the applied sciences. And I, I have an idea to one day write a paper about this, um, and I, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So I'm going to explain the idea for the concept uh, in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> Here's best practice. Best practice for the practice of statistics or generating evidence for the support of claims in the scientific method is that we start off with some formulation of the hypothesis, objective, or claim. Okay, some formulation. Second, we specify the statistical model. This is the, the formal or informal practice of, uh, of formulating the null versus the alternative hypothesis that corresponds to the claim you want to make. And, and oftentimes there might be many you know, you pick up a paper these days, um, there might be uh, 30 p-values reported, okay? So that would mean that implicitly there are 30 versions of the, the null and the alternative hypothesis that would be specified from a statistical model. Now, you know as well as I do from the, um, from the scientific papers that you've read that we... we scientists actually don't communicate to each other by specifying the null and the alternative hypothesis. Instead, it's uh, implied. It's an implicit thing that um, is based on the, the statistical models that we, we report. Okay, but I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, then we identify data collection methods um, formally. We may already have an idea of the, the experiment we would like to conduct, but once we, um, we identify that statistical model, um, we figure out what data we're going to collect and 
aspects of the sampling as well. Now these last two um, are not uh, not uh, practiced all the time, but they're elements of best practice. They're essential elements of best practice, and uh, a lot of people would agree with the the dramatic statement that if you're not doing these last two steps, um, you're not doing reproducible science. So one of them, the first one, is to identify the effect size. And we can think of, until we, uh, until we go through it more, we have talked about it quite a lot in the whole series for the last year or two in Herrick. We've mentioned it a number of times. But what you can think of the effect size as uh, if, if you're um, predicting a difference or if you, if you have a claim about a difference or an effect, the effect size is, um, we can interpret it in a number of ways. We can interpret it how confident you are that your claim is true. So if you're very competent, your, uh, your effect size would be large. If there's a lot of evidence backing up the prediction of your claim, the effect size, we would assume, is large. But, but actually, the effect size means something specific. It's not just a heuristic um, idea. It's not just a concept. It's something we can put a number on. And um, the calculation of the effect size um, uh, can be do, done with pilot data or can be derived from the literature. And, and if we don't have pilot data or if we can't derive it from the literature, then we would revert back to how confident you expect the uh, the difference to be true is and then finally one, once we have our statistical model identified once we have our estimate of the effect size we would go through this process of justifying our sample size um, in the in many fields let's just say one um, human medical um, health for a clinical medical trial it's not good enough to say Eh, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna give 20 patients this placebo, and I think I'm gonna stick uh, a needle into 20 other guys um, with this drug. Uh, 20 sounds about right. It's it's a good number. It's a good number. That's just not good enough. That's um, it's poor. It's poor. It's poor practice, and um, it it is unacceptable completely. Uh, that's because the stakes are high, and it's very unethical to do that. But it also what, what if 20 is um, more than enough patients to, uh, to um, be able to achieve a good probability of detecting you're correct versus reality of actually being correct? Then you've wasted resources and maybe you've, you've used some patients in a placebo trial that could have received an effective drug, very unethical. Or what if, what if um, the effect size is small or medium size and 20 isn't quite enough to be able to reasonably achieve uh, a good chance of detecting a effect and, and let's say the effect is real it's also very unethical because you've impacted those patients and we have a, a poor chance of affecting it now this is a big topic <clears throat> but the justification of sample size is is one of the big ways you can up your practice Let's, let's move from the human health example, and I'll just briefly say that um, in our own day-to-day -day practice, the stakes aren't as high. And, and oftentimes, um, it's, it's examining full from the full front the sample size that separates good science from bad science. Um, also, if you waste your time, it's, it's your time you're wasting. So it's a really good habit to get into. So here's, here's the idea as I see it. This is what I call the uh, yield scientific process model. This is what we teach the children in school. You know, the first time we tell them what science is, we show children this figure. And uh, we say, well, we, we ask a question or formulate a hypothesis, uh, ask a question that's, that's, um, that's uh, a good question. We ask if... It, by querying existing evidence, so as a scientist, um, you know we would hit the literature, but we tell the kids in school, you do you do a research, you you ask other peers, um, and we ask other scientists what existing evidence there is about that question, and um, 
that we use that to inform our hypothesis, after which we perform an experiment to test our hypothesis, after which we take our data and perform the analysis, and uh, after which we form conclusions. And, and if we've learned something, we communicate it on, and maybe that changes the way we think about how the world works, um, and we revise the question we want to ask. Okay, so this is the my version of the old um, scientific process. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it does work, and it is very generally how science works. But um, the part I have a problem with is is these parts right here. Um, many many representations of the scientific process don't have the analysis um, part in there at all, but some do. And um, the the thing I don't like about it is that um, the order that we think about these things in is usually that we have the idea sprouting from the forehead and we perform our experiment after which we think about the analysis. Now I observe, I have a kind of unique position being an applied statistician. Uh, I mean it's unique amongst um, people that aren't applied statisticians, but all applied statisticians um, um, would agree, I think, with what I'm about to say is that this implies, this model implies that we think about the analysis after we do the experiment. That And that is common practice amongst a lot of uh, scientists. But what we should actually be doing is uh, when we have our hypothesis, we should use that to design our experiment. And um, this involves um, bringing in existing evidence, thinking about our effect size, um, just like we talked about, and, and performing power analysis to justify our sample size. And th this is the most formal way to do it, but there are less formal ways to do it. And in the process of designing the experiment, we, we go beyond the statement of claim or objective or hypothesis informal, and we form the, that statistical hypothesis that is tied to a particular test. And um, if we put all of this part of the, this cycle together, that is what we would call a statistical analysis plan. We should do these formally in, in the medical biology field to get a grant or um, to, per, to perform an experiment with, uh, with live subjects, even if they're, they're animal subjects. By the way, um, some of you that work in animal science um, will already be used to this cycle, but people in other fields, um, this may be new to you. Uh, what I call a statistical analysis plan just, uh, just justifies how much data you're collecting and how you're going to analyze it. Um, and after you have that, then we collect the data, then we collate our results and analyze um, based on our uh, analysis plan, and then the cycle continues. So this is sort of the, uh, I say it's the new scientific process model, but um, these tools have been around for quite a long time. It's just that it's permeating different fields uh, at different rates. Okay. So I'm just going to have a peek at the time. We are almost out of time. Are there any comments or questions? Or else I'll um, bring up R real quick and uh, run through the code, some of the code. Maybe put a one in the chat if uh, you're good and you want to see some coding, or a two if you have a question, or you can just yell it out. Let's go for one. All right, I'll go one, a unanimous vote of one. There's two. Okay, let's just go over to R. And I'm going to, um, I've got the script is, um, I think the script is linked up there, but I'll, I'll um, do this afterwards. And let me go to my R Studio view there. Okay. So um, just like usual, I've got my header. I'm going to just make this a little bit bigger for us to uh, look at together. And I'll bring this over. Uh, I've got contents, and these correspond to the sections in the um, in the boot camp. And um, I've put all the code into this script. I do recommend if you're going to it yourself, especially if you're just beginning to type it all yourself, you'll 
you'll learn much faster that way, even though it seems like a faff, not to copy and paste it. But I'm just going to step through this code. I'm going to load in the OpenXLSS library. You can see it just echo my command down in the console. If you want to look down in the console, 3, 2, 1. So it's just echoed the command. And then I'm going to set my working directory on line 30, 3, 2, 1. It echoes the command, no complaints. And then I'm going to read in the data, and we should see the um, data frame appear up in the global environment. Three, two, one. There it is. Let's just have a peek. So we've got our two um, variables there. We're going to convert feed to a factor. Um, so we can use the class fa um, variable to see in, in just in code what class it is. We can just peek up here. We know it's a character, but Let's just, for giggles, um, run it. You can look down in the console, three, two, one. So we do see it's a character. So I'm just gonna use the factor uh, function to convert chick feed uh, into a factor. Now, you can look down in the console, but if you keep your eye up here on this part in the global environment, we'll see it click over, three, two, one. There we go, and we can see now that it's got six levels. Notice that it um, changed the order of the levels. It's put them in alphabetical order, which is not the order they occur in the rows. Uh, we have talked a little bit about that before, but it's just something that the passive-aggressive butler does for us, whether we want it or not. And now we can check using the class function again what the um, function of it is. Look down in the console, three, two, one. We can see it's changed to factor. Okay, so I'm going to summary on chicks, the chicks data object. We've done this in the lecture, three, two, one. And we just get those descriptive statistics. Here, with feed as a factor, we get the counts of the number of observations, the number of rows where feed is set to each of those levels. And we see there are approximately similar um, number of rows, similar number of observations for each of those levels, but they're not uh, exactly the same. This isn't the perfectly balanced data set. On lines um, <clears throat> 46 and 47, I've uh, generated the summary statistics for the Cassian level, 3, 2, 1. And then for the horse bean level, 3, 2, 1. There we go. Um, and we looked at that in the lecture. Now for aggregate, um, the simple use is to take a, a numeric variable. Uh, it could be another kind of variable than numeric, but um, so aggregate will work on other kinds of variables. But here it is a numeric variable. The by variable has to be a list. So um, this is a list containing our factor. The reason it has to be a list is um, a list is a kind of data object that um, that contains uh, can contain different variable types, and they can have all different lengths. So even though a data frame can contain different variable types, it can't contain different lengths. And uh, that makes the list very, very flexible. and it, is just so happens that it's required for aggregate. Uh, and here we're just setting the function the simplest way to a single function name, no open brackets for mean, and it's just going to apply mean to each of the levels of chick feed on that variable weight. So let's just see what we get out from this aggregate call. Calculate the mean, three, two, one. So we get a list of that group one. Um, our chick feed, and then just the mean. Then we can do it for the standard deviation, setting the fun argument to SD, 3, 2, 1. Down in the console, and we get the standard deviation. And then I've calculated it for the standard error. So this is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the um, number of observations, so the square root, root of the length of x. Um, that's just the number of, um, <clears throat> of uh, observations in each of the factor levels. So we can just look at that. It'll be uh, an object just like that. So look in the console, 3, 2, 1. So we get the standard uh, error of the mean. And this just weights the mean relative to the sample size in a standard way. And you can use this syntax if you're interested to see how I did the multiple functions to make a new data frame that's got all summary statistics. You can have a look at this and copy that pattern for your own code. All right. Um, we 
I have done a bit of graphing already, so I'm not going to spend much time on these, but we can make a default histogram, look down in the plots, 3, 2, 1, it's a chick weight. To make that a little bit bigger so it's nicer to look at. And um, yeah, you know, the those um, titles are terrible, so we could add nice titles with the, the main um, up above, and I think the big innovation is setting the x-axis with the um, units, 3, 2, 1. Then um, we can add a vertical line for the um, mean weight. Uh, so I could redraw the, the graph there, and this is that AB line when we want to draw a line across the, the parts of a graph. Now this thing that I've just demonstrated, they're all real simple graphs, but um, it's free to make a lot of versions of the same graph, and they're like little experiments. And the way that I think of building up a nice graph is uh, for a publication, I, I may have run that graph code a hundred times. Easy, sometimes many more times than that. I have one graph that I think I must have run over 200 times to get it exactly like I wanted for a publication. And they ended up, uh, the reviewers didn't really like it, but I had invested in it so much. It was like the Concord fallacy. I'd invested so much I didn't want to give up on it. And I, I did win in the end and they did publish it. It was a very complicated box plot graph. But I often will um, make layers and layers of different graphs to build it up in just little steps rather than trying to make the perfect graph the first time. That's a lot harder to do that <clears throat> for me included. So the basic box plot is just a, it can just be a um, single variable. This is all the chick weights all at once, not, not distinguished by any factor. Um, this is a really bad graph. No labels, no nothing. This is a, just a terrible graph. Um, so weight as a function of feed. Notice um, the graph's not wide enough to display all the um, the factor levels. Oftentimes we would we would redraw the factor levels at a at an angle to have a normal width graph, or or do other things to make it look better. But I'm not going to bother with that here. That's um, the whole code that's involved in this. We are out of time, and because of the recording and um, just to stick to the way we usually do things in here, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it and just ask if there are any questions or comments. And I also want to, um, after I give you a minute to ask any questions or make comments, <clears throat> I want to say something about what's going to happen in the next four R meetings. So, um, so are there any comments or questions? Thank you, Juliana. It's always a pleasure. I'm really happy to be back and having the R groups uh, every week. So thank you guys for coming. It's a, it's a good group. Let, let me say a few remarks about what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Uh, one thing that I mentioned in the email is that um, I've decided because the term has started and, and other demands on my time, as you know, that I can't sustain organizing two meetings every week. I was doing um, the, uh, the uh, yes, exactly, George. I was doing R meetings every week and Python meetings every week. And instead, we're just going to have uh, the one meeting every week, but I'll bring in Python topics and, and mix them. Maybe we'll alternate, but for the next few meetings, it'll be are in stats. If you have any ideas for topics, if you're working on something, it, it could be really difficult or it could be very easy. Um, I, I'm very happy to fold these in into the meetings. As I go through the boot camp, um, there's plenty of time, even though we I, I can easily use all the time for one of the boot camp pages, there's plenty of time to just say, I'm going to go through the lecture fast and now we're going to slip in this other little thing. No matter what it is, if you want to do that, I'm very happy to do that. And we could also mix R and Python if, if anybody wants to. I've been using Python heavily um, for a few little things in the last year, and um, I think that I can make that work if people are interested in doing that. The thing I want to say about the next four weeks is I'm, I'm going to meet at four with you guys and continue marching through the boot camp with a lecture to start off with and 
what I what I think the most useful part of these lectures will be is just to give you my take on what I think you should be getting out of the boot camp. If you do go ahead and you've saved any questions or problems you have on the exercises, we can start off with them and I'm happy to talk about solutions or uh, help with problems. Thing that I'll just remind everybody, and I've said it many times in here and I'll, I'm sure I'll say it some more, is that I don't like to give explicit um, solutions to those little exercises. And the reason I don't is because the solution, one, the solution is not important at all. It's getting to the solution that's the interesting, fun, and important part. Two, I don't want to constrain the possible solutions. There may be a hundred solutions for one of the one of the questions, and I don't want to constrain thinking about the possible solutions by showing you one solution. And uh, I don't have the stamina, really, to come up with a hundred different solutions to show you, and that would be overwhelming and defeat the point anyway. So, um, so we can do that. But the real thing that I wanted to mention about the next four weeks is that the R meetings will go uh, so from four to five as usual, but then there'll, there'll be a separate meeting to carry on from five to seven. And uh, I'm going to try something for the first time this year to invite um, new master students into our team's meetings who will be doing the uh, they'll all be learning R from the very beginning who may need support. Now you don't have to attend these if you don't want to, um, but what we're going to do is uh, several of us are going to break out. We'll see how many turn up uh, in the first place and we'll, we'll uh, break out into rooms and we'll just use the time in the rooms to answer questions, but we'll use that time to actually do the boot camp, including the problem um, uh, questions, the exercises. Now the new master students coming in will be doing it for the first time, but if some of you are looking for time to do it, you may you may want to do it there too. Um, I'll just mention again, if anybody is interested in being paid to lead one of those breakout rooms, there is money available. <laughs> so I have I have enough money to pay for two people, two PhD demonstrators, to add to myself. Um, Matt Butler, George Wager, and Joe Roberts. And, and if all the students come, uh, there are about 70 students, I'm told, enrolled this year. So we'll see how many show up next time. That's all I have for tonight. So fun to be back. I'll, um, I'll upload this, um, and I'll set the, the uh, web page up and put the links to the YouTube afterwards. That's all I've got. So if there's nothing else, have a nice night, guys. It's good to be back. Good to see a lot of people here, and I'll see you next time. I'm just going to close the...